Thank you for joining me for this episode. Uh, I am joined today by Dr. Patrick Johnson and Dr. Mark Bullimore. We're going to be speaking about compounding atropine and its challenges today on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. A special thank you to Synexis for being a sponsor of the Myopia Podcast. If you're not aware, Synexis is a biopharmaceutical company that was founded in 2014. They're based in Del Mar, California. Their mission is to develop a proprietary, stable, accurate, effective, safe topical eye drop to treat the progression of myopia in children and to minimize the risk of comorbidities later in life. They're on the cusp of a new treatment paradigm to fight myopia progression in children. They're in the late stage of their pivotal phase three trial for their investigation medication, SYD101. The Myopia Podcast and myself are rooting for them and are watching Synexus closely. Stay tuned. Thanks again for joining us for the Myopia Podcast. I'm excited to uh, be joined today by an old friend of the Myopia Podcast, Mark Bullimore, who was in one of our first couple of episodes and uh, been able to wrangle him back to to be on the podcast again, an old friend of the <clears throat> Myopia world for sure, along with uh, Dr. Patrick Johnson. Uh, Dr. Bullimore and Dr. Johnson are huge innovators and leaders in the world of myopia. And so I'm excited to have them. Welcome, gentlemen. Mark, can you uh, tell us a little bit of your history? And uh, I, I think you've done a little bit in the myopia space. Um, yeah, I, I must say that having skied all the last week with my 20-something nephews, my old friend is very germane. So yeah, I'm a recovering professor of optometry, still very much involved in uh, publishing. Um, but spend most of my time working with companies large and small, old and new, um, particularly at the moment in the area of myopia. So uh, thanks for the kind words of introduction. Absolutely. And Dr. Johnson, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. I'm excited to be here. So my background is really founded in academia. I got a PhD in molecular neurobiology of the eye, and so spent many years doing that. And I left and started a company and learned how the uh, the private world works in small companies and went to a big company. And I like to say I got my second PhD at Allergan, where I ran a corporate development group there for a number of years, basically looked at everything in ophthalmology and optometry combined, every drug that was being applied to the space I, I basically saw for a long time. So gained a lot of knowledge around pharmaceutical drug development and the nuances of, of doing that at work. And then uh, about six years ago, left to uh, to join Synexis and do what we're doing now, which is conducting the largest study ever conducted in myopia. So really excited to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, so, you know, when we're thinking about the future of myopia management, one of the things that continually comes to my mind is how do we get more, more options to more patients? And, you know, looking to one of the oldest and most longstanding treatments uh, of atropine, it just comes to mind. But, you know, recently that has been challenged in my mind a little bit because of a study that uh, came out about how atropine may not be an effective treatment for myopia management. Now, I always look at these at grain of salt because this was one study, but it was from a pretty profound source with the NIH. And Mark, I was hoping you could share a little bit of your perspective on this. You read studies and analyze studies in the most intense way of anybody I know. You summarize studies and put them together so that us lay people can understand them, but yet you look at the statistics at a at a far greater uh, level than I can ever imagine to do. I was hoping you could give us a little bit of a rundown on should we be thinking about atropine or should we just wipe it off the slate for the future based off of this study? As I like to say, uh, statistics are never having to say you're certain. So <laughs> you have to, as you said, um, look at the big picture with any study. So it was an NIH-funded study, so they released a statement because of that. But obviously, the work was done by independent investigators around the country, large group of sites. Um, and really, it's the first study that suggested that 0.01% atropine wasn't effective. Um, 
Prior to that, a lot of studies have found it to be affected to a greater or lesser degree. So I don't regard this study as necessarily being conflicting or even an outlier. It's just part of a continuum of results because if you do a study, particularly one based on a modest number of patients compared to others, you will end up with different results um, at different times. So this is just, you know, at that end. And yeah. there are additional challenges, of course, with COVID. Um, there's always an issue um, with compliance and are the kids taking the drops and are they taking them regularly? Um, that might have been handled better. Um, so it doesn't really change my mind on where I sit on atropine as a viable option. You know, I, I, I think that the interesting component of it is that it was saying 0.01%. And recently, we've seen some other studies coming out that have looked at how pharmacies uh, across the country, because the only way we can get it is through compounding pharmacies, may have some variability in what you're actually getting. And so, you know, what was actually the treatment? And you know, I know, Mark, you've you've done a lot of work in this particular area as well. And Patrick, I want to hear your perspective on the pharmacy world of what's what's being out there. But, um, you know, maybe 0.01 percent may not be 0.01 percent. Um, tell us a little bit about that and, and what some of these studies have said. You've got to remember that the FDA really doesn't control or uh, monitor the compound in pharmacy world. So. Compound in pharmacies obviously have a useful role for making things like fortified antibiotics, um, but they also found a nice niche with atropine by basically taking atropine powder or 1% and essentially making it up at a lower concentration. And in the US, that's the only way you can access um, low concentration atropine at the moment. Um, as we identified in a pair of papers, there's a huge amount of variability in terms of how the atropine's made up, whether they like, start with powder or with solution, whether they add saline, whether they add artificial tears, and other things that they may or may not add. Um, one of the things that is evident from that is that they're not paying attention to stability in the way that somebody like Patrick and Sydnexus and other manufacturers who would like to have an FDA approved uh, formulation, um, they don't, you know, they they pay much greater attention. Yeah. And when we when we analysed um, the atropine from a number of compounded pharmacies, a lot of it wasn't stable. So the concentration after a month was below what it was meant to be. Um, mm. There were also other things in there that we couldn't identify. So. Mm -hmm. I really do believe that there is a need for an FDA-approved um, product that is outside the compound and pharmacy world. Yeah. Patrick, can you speak to this for a little bit? Because, you know, as a practitioner, I order up a medication and I expect I'm getting what I'm ordering, right? And, and same with same with you, Mark, when you've you when you were seeing patients is I expect that if I order a 0.01% or a 0.05 or a 0.1% or a 1% of something, that that's what I'm going to be getting, you know, is, is this, this work that was recently published, Mark did a lot of work on this, is we're not getting what we're ordering and we don't know that. Why is it so difficult? Tell us a little bit about atropine. And what is it about atropine that makes so much variability and why can't they get it right? Yeah, I'm not sure we have enough time to go into all these uh, <clears throat> details, but it's a really interesting question. I've been on the podium a handful of times and this is always the topic that people are most interested in. They always say, I didn't really know that much about compounding. Compounding is the Wild West and it's meant to be that way. The Wild West is, is a structure that existed long before cities existed, right? It was wild. When you have a city, you can have organization and structure. When you have the Wild West, people just do whatever they want. And compounding pharmacies, as Mark said, they fill a need. They do things. They, they, they create drugs. They develop drugs. They, they, they distribute drugs that doctors want made that aren't commercially available. 
they do things that aren't available. And so there's two types of compounding, 503A and 503B. 503A is the vast majority of compounding. And that's when you submit a, a prescription to a compounding pharmacy and Susie or Bill in the back goes, makes it up and says, here you go. They do it five mils at a time, one bottle at a time. They don't have enough volume in that solution, that five mils, to test anything that they've done. So you hope that Susie and Bill made it up properly. And then they hand it to the patient. There's no testing that goes on. And then that's what the patient gets and that's what they use. So compounding pharmacies do what the, um, what the physicians tell them to do. Now, what the physicians are telling them to do is I want a 0.01%. It doesn't say I want it in boric acid. It doesn't say I want it with a preservative. It doesn't say I want it in a low pH. It doesn't say I want it in a stable formulation. It just says I want 0.01% for my patient. So they have the authority to make it up however they want. They can do whatever they want. And they do, as Mark's research suggested and, and demonstrated with data. There were, I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't want to paraphrase here, I'll get the numbers wrong, but there were something like 27 pharmacies and I think 25 different formulations. It was something, you know, everything was made differently is the point of the paper. And, and but Mark's Patrick, got the exact numbers. Wh what is it that makes it so that when I order 0.01% from one, I don't get the exact same thing from five different ones? You know, you, you mentioned boric acid, you mentioned pH, like what, what, what should it be? Like, like I, bottle size, temperature, like all of these things seem to, you know, Mark brought that up in his paper um, yeah. with, with Catherine and Aaron. And like, we don't know this stuff. Tell us what should it be? Having been in the pharmaceutical industry for a long time and understanding how drugs get made, why they get made, when they get made, what's in them. But you have to realize when you start making these things is that not all active pharmaceutical ingredients, atropine, not all active drugs are created equally. Some are susceptible to hydrolysis, they break down. Some are susceptible to temperature, they break down. Some are very stable. Some have to be in water-based solutions. Some have to be in, in lipid-based or oil-based solutions, or they don't work right. Cyclosporin restasis is a great example. That formulation is the most complicated formulation that's been made in our industry and people couldn't copy it because cyclosporin is unique API. Come back to atropine. Atropine is extremely sensitive to all these things I mentioned earlier, hydrolysis, temperature, pH, very sensitive. And compounding pharmacists don't know that. They don't have to because all they have to do is make 0.01% and give it to the doctor. So it's, it's, the lack of knowledge that's created the high variability in product distribution to patients that Mark and his team were really commenting on. And they really are the first group to demonstrate with data how variable the compounding of 0.01% atropine is. Our whole it's company the, is based on the fact that atropine is a very sensitive molecule, not like other molecules. You can't just put it in water. You can't just put it at high pH, which is comfortable. You can't just put it in any old formulation. You have to be very careful where you put it. What kind so of formulation one of the things that, that, that I learned is from, from this work that Mark and his group did is if it doesn't sting, it may be a problem. It, is, is that true? <laughs> well, it depends, depends on, uh, depends on how else it's formulated because, um, Patrick and his team have a few other sort of tricks up their sleeve, but you know, ideally, um, atropine should be prepared at a slightly acidic um, pH because that's when it's most stable. Um, it was clear to us that a lot of the compounded pharmacies were ignoring that and preparing it um, in a very neutral uh, formulation. So um, I, might, I might order this at, at a 0.01%. And could I be correct that that actually may be what the patient gets on day one? but it may change over over a short period of time. Dog going crazy there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, if it's not if it's not prepared with with the proper care, whether it's pH or some other tricks, um, it will degrade over time. And you know when mm -hmm. we analyzed, we found I think a quarter of them were below um, 90% of what they should be, and some as low as 75%. So, yeah, absolutely, you're not going to get 
what you expect if it's not stable. And as Patrick already emphasized, and I did as well, there's very few regulations that uh, govern compounding pharmacies. If, if they exist, they're at the state level and they're not really monitored. Now, that, that's not saying that these guys are bad actors. Um, I just think in the case of atropine, there's a little um, ignorance um, involved such that they're not paying attention to what they need to pay attention to. They're just going about their business without seeing the whole playing field. Yeah. Patrick, um, let's talk a little bit about stability. So what are some things that you think that people today who are getting compounded atropine can do to help keep the drug as best as it possibly can? For instance, I'm I'm looking at, at the paper here, uh, package labeling from three pharmacies instructed to refrigerate, that was 33%. Three to store in a dark, cool, dry place, uh, which is 33%, and three to store at room temperature. Um, there was probably a reason why you put that in the paper, Mark. Uh, what what should it be? Like, what should we be doing to try to help stabilize this highly volatile uh, drug that is, that is out there, uh, you know, if it's being compounded? Yeah, that's a really good question. And and all of the information that people would really like to have. So the answer to your question, it's not all in one place. It's mm -hmm. all over the literature. Atropine has been around forever. It's been around for 60 years, 60 years in its physical form that people we know of now. It's been around for a couple hundred years as far as a, uh, an isolated compound. It's been around for a thousand years as far as something that's been used in, in the world of, of medicine. So there's three things we know that really can impact the stability of atropine. It's temperature, it's pH, and it's light. And so you have to keep track of all those things. So light, no light. Light's bad. That's easy. Opaque bottles, most people do that. Um, temperature, the warmer atropine is, the, more fast, the, the faster it will degrade. So that's number one. And you have to work... You have to keep that into consideration as you're developing the pH, which is consideration number two. The lower the pH of atropine, the more stable it gets. So we all want things to be at pH seven, around pH seven, because that's physiologic pH. It's comfortable. It's a drop that goes in your eye. It feels good. As you drop the pH too low, it becomes more acidic. And the problem with that is that it uncomfortable. It causes tearing. The tearing will wash a drug off the surface of the eye, but you've got a stable form of atropine. What also happens is when you drop the pH, atropine becomes a charged molecule. People don't know this. Charged molecules don't cross biologic membranes as easily as non-charged molecules. So you're dropping the pH to stabilize it, but you might also be hurting the efficacy because it's now 10 times more charged for every pH unit. That's just math and science. So there's a nuance here that you have to use if you want to be comfortable with, this, with, with providing a stable form of atropine to a patient. Now, we believe that high pH is great for efficacy, non-charged molecules, but bad for stability because the stability is going to be, in, the degradation is going to increase at higher pH and higher temperature. So for example, a room temperature pH seven formulation of atropine will degrade at approximately 5% in four weeks. That's mm. the FDA typical allowable limit for degradation in one year for an approved product. So you've got something that's degrading 10 times more than the FDA is comfortable. With yeah. And there's no regulation typical because formulation. it's compounded, yeah. right? So there's no regulation. There. No regulation of that. Yeah. And so, one of the things to ease the burden, uh, and Mark, you probably saw this a ton, is, you know, order a three-month supply, right, with no instructions as to what to do with this thing. And, you know, if you do it at that and it reduces 5% in one month, I don't get to that third bottle and it's already reduced at minimum 15%, but probably more than that by the time I even get to that bottle. I mean, right? Yeah, the if you look at the regulations 
concerning compounded drugs, they're not meant to make anything with a beyond use date of more than I think 28 days or maybe 30 days. I forget what the answers are. Um, so even then, it may be nice from a financial point of view to ship three months at once or three months supply. Um, but both from a regulation point of view and from a scientific point of view, um, if it's not being done properly, then, you know, it's uh, it's a challenge. Patrick will probably tell you that his drug and other people who are doing it right, they have to actually show that it's stable for much, much, much longer. Um, but with, with compounded pharmacies, the bar is so low, you can't see it. Yeah. So, Mark, I want you to guess at this, and I kind of think I know what your answer is going to be because you don't like to put yourself in the shoes of the entire eye care world. But do you think that this could be the reason why people are ordering higher concentrations of atropine and thinking, oh, well, I didn't get the effect at 0.01%. And so maybe they're ordering higher concentrations. And the reality is that 0.01%, if it had been stable, and we don't know this, but uh, we'll hopefully have some data, but had it been stable, it would have been just fine. But now that they're ordering higher concentrations and an effect that it become, becomes less stable, and now they're getting a lower concentration over time, you know, th th that to me has been like, oh, well, I use 0.05% for the vast majority of my patients. And I presume that they're mostly at least getting 0.01%. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, I do think um, there is a dose response effect. And um, the higher the concentration, the greater the myopia control that you should achieve. And from carefully done studies, that's what you see. Now, in some studies, you get um, counterintuitive results where the 0.02 right. was less effective than the 0.01. That probably comes down to compliance and, um, you know, one group do it, you know, being more compliant than the other, but we don't have time to get into that. You know, I think 0 0.03, 0 0.05, if done properly, is going to be more effective. Now, whether you know people are hedging and prescribing something more because of their worries about the compounding, or they just want to give the maximum uh, tolerable dose in order to get the maximum efficacy, um, I think that comes into it too. Yeah. Anything else that you kind of found in uh, in in your data? You know, in this this uh, this publication, um, if if you're not aware of it, was published uh, in Eye and Contact Lens 2023. Uh, compounding 0 0.01 uh, percent atropine. What's in the bottle? Uh, anything be, you know that you found in this that we haven't touched on that you think you know needs to be part of this discussion we're having here? Um. Yeah, I th I think everybody should be looking forward to and hoping for an, an FDA approved, um, you know, manufactured drug, so we can move away from the the, the uncertainties of compounded, um, yeah. drugs. But uh, I think we've covered most of it, and uh, anything else would be sort of, uh, um, sort of. Uh, beating a dead horse. So to speak. Yeah. Well, you know, a concluding sentence was that the potency failure rates are six to seven times greater than those of the FDA approved products. And so I, I certainly think that that, you know, may give us, you know, a real good credence of why we need an FDA approved product. I'll tell you in conversations with various different companies who have shared with me over the years that they're working on an FDA approved bottle, my, my perception of that has changed dramatically. Cause I, I originally thought, well, why the heck would I ever do that? I can get it, you know, maybe be able to get it at a compounding pharmacy, but these data points that are coming out as to, I have no idea what I'm getting. And I don't know even what I'm getting because you didn't disclose who the different compounding pharmacies were from each of the different pharmacies that are out there, it kind of says, well, hey, yeah, having something coming in the future, which 
has that stability that we know matches the FDA guidelines where, you know, only 2%, I think in the, in the study would be anywhere near that really proves that. And, and Patrick, I know you've been working on this for a really long time. Can you share a little bit about what the future might hold? You don't have an approved product right now, but what are the things that you're working on and what are the barriers that you had and have had and where are the studies at right now that might prove something is in the works? Yeah, it's it's a really rich question. And, you know, when there isn't an approved drug, uh, we try and do what we can with the information we have to, to treat our kids. And it's really important that we, we try. But if you go back to our food industry, right, we're so careful about is it organic? Is it not? What are the ingredients? We don't do that with drugs that we take, right? We should we should be doing that with drugs that we take. So what, what we're required to do in, in the pharmaceutical world to get a drug approved is to definitively show in these very large studies that the drug works. And what's really important, according to the FDA and for our entire industry, is that we develop a manufacturing program that's robust and very consistent from batch to batch. It takes us to release a batch into the clinic and then ultimately into the market. It takes us about four months from when we start making it to when we finish making it to when we test it to when we get the results in and have a team of individuals analyzing those results. It takes us four months to get a single batch of product released so that we can then sell it commercially. Now, a compounding pharmacy goes in and Bill or Susie mixes it up and sends it to the kid. That's that's the difference between what we do in the pharmaceutical world trying to get a drug approved. It's hard. It's a lot of work and a lot of companies fail at doing it. Mm -hmm. In the end, what I love about what Mark and his group did was, look, it's all about data. Data is what we use to make decisions. And Mark's group demonstrated that there's a lot of variability in these atropine formulations. He's also demonstrated there's a lot of variability in the results we see with atropine studies. I shouldn't be very surprising to us. Not all formulations are created equally. So in the end, we're four months away from uh, our study, our three-year primary endpoint on our pivotal study, uh, testing our drug SIT-101, which is a very stable and high pH formulation of low-dose atropine. We're looking at two doses, 0.01 and 0.03. And so we've, we've been spending five years uh, running this study in a very robust manner. We've enrolled 852 kids, the largest study by almost 50% that's ever been conducted in this space. And look, the goal is very simple. Generate data that people can use to make prescribing, informed prescribing decisions, right? And all we wanna do is put a drug out there with data that supports using it in kids. And what we're hoping is that we see a very robust efficacy. And we know that our formulation is very stable. We've done a lot of engineering with it. So, you know, we believe that we have the right formulation for the market, the data will be the data. We'll release that. You'll hear about it this summer. And, and we're really hoping that we've done what we've set out to do. Spent a lot of money and a lot of time doing this. And so we're hoping that we did it right. And that's all you can do in this industry is use data yeah. to build the product, to get it into the market. And then the data from the product in the clinical trials will tell people how to use it. Yeah. And I don't mean to be uh, a, a downer here, but that doesn't mean that once your data is released that we get drug right away, right? We're still months away. Then you put that to the FDA. Then the FDA looks at that data. And then, you know, uh, all the all the people, you know, advocate for it and we work towards it. And then hopefully we would uh, consider having a drug on the market. 25, 26, right? Is that kind of a time frame that we would be hopeful for with all of the different companies? I don't mean to ca just call you out, but we're That's we're right. still a ways away uh, from it. But uh, the data is the first step. And then that data then goes to the FDA. Is that the right process? That's right. The FDA is very careful with the process and they should be because in this example, this is a drug that's going to be potentially used by millions of kids and you don't take that lightly at all. It yeah. is something that should be taken very seriously. So the FDA takes their time. They review the data. They talk about it. They ask us questions. They review our questions. They talk about it some more. They ask us more questions. And that takes over a year. Um, so generally from when you have your, 
your data, it takes about 16 months to when you can get your drug approved if everything goes smoothly. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking on something big. I know it takes a long time to get something uh, like this out. Obviously, the data that's coming out even now is telling us more and more that there is a need for it. And uh, Mark, your your incredible work has really been helpful in bringing this to light of why we need this. Uh, but you're you're telling us that we need to do better, and we don't have great products for that yet. I think I took away something that is going to help me in clinic today, and that is that I may be more helpful thinking about ordering less product for, for my patients as opposed to a huge supply of it uh, in the time being, you know, making sure that the bottle is protective and that we don't have a whole lot of light to it. So if possible, keep it in a darker place. Um especially if we're, you know, storing it, make sure it's not stored in a warm, hot place because that may make it less effective. Um, and uh, until we get great news from you and other companies that are out there that the FDA is in agreement that this is what we need to be doing, um, I think those are the best things that we can do. Anything closing from either of you? Um, just to, yeah point out that frustrations exist across the board in the u.s <laughs> they do uh, people in canada already have access to uh state-of-the-art myopia control spectacles and a host of other contact lenses and uh, people in the u.s are uh sit in and wait in so uh it's uh it's a challenge but we've got to be patient that's right absolutely yeah. And, you know, my, my only closing words are really that, look, we're going to look back in a few years, um, you know, in three or four years, we're going to have a lot of, a lot of options to treat myopia. And we're going through a phase right now where we're still trying to figure out which options are the best and which work well, but we'll be there in a few years and we just have to be patient and we have to use products in these, in our kids that have a lot of data behind them to support the ethical use and the effective use and the safe use of these products it's critical to our industry and so we need to create trust in our industry by robust data sets to support approvals and unfortunately that takes time so look we're going to look back in a couple of years and we'll all be there we'll all be good yeah well awesome well thank you gentlemen for joining me for this episode and uh, thank you for listening to this episode of the myopia podcast make sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes One, two. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.